Hello and welcome to the lecture for Concrete for the final exam review. As you can hear, I'm a bit under the weather, so I do apologize for the my voice, which hopefully you can hear me clearly, or if not, hopefully I'll be a bit entertaining. So there's two problems that we're going to go through today. One is a T-beam design and the other is a column design. So the first problem that we have, we have a T-beam. We're asked to design it with the cross section that we have shown here. The floor is supported by a 4-inch slab, and there's a 15-foot span. Now, that span is in and out of the board towards you and me. The concrete has a strength of 3 KSI, and F of Y is 60 KSI. Now, it has already been determined that the applied factored moment, M sub U, is 600 kip feet. You have to add in the weight of the beam once you know the T-beam's configuration. So again, we pretty much go through the same steps over and over. Determine M sub U, which has already been defined for us, and then design based on M sub R, such that it's greater than M sub U, and then check any of the ACI codes. So our first step is to compute M sub U, but like we said, it was already given. But what I am going to do is I'm going to add the weight of the beam. So let me give you all of those pieces here, so that I can add the weight of the beam to M sub U. So first, in order to determine the beam's weight or the distributed weight of the beam, W sub U, I factor it because it's a dead load by 1.2 times the unit weight of concrete, which is 0.15 pounds per cubic foot. Oh, that should be kips per cubic foot. I apologize. That's a kip. Times 12 inches by 18 inches. Again, the width of the T-beam's web is 12 inches times the, the height which is 18 inches, this piece here, just the T-beam's web, plus you also want to add the weight of the slab in, which is 4 by 96 inches, again 4 by 96, now again 96 is eight, 96 inches is 8 feet, so again each T-beam is responsible for 4 inches in each direction, or 48 inches on either side, or a total of 96 inches. Now again, we want to convert that into feet squared. Now when we calculate that, we get a total of 0.75 kips per linear foot. I'll just take a moment to correct that into kips. Now that we properly have our kips per cubic foot written in, now let's take that distributed load and turn it into a moment. Again, since it's a, a constant distributed load across the T-beam, across that 15 feet, we have 0.75 kips per linear foot times our length of our span, which is 15 feet squared, divided by 8, and that gives us a total additional moment of 21 kip feet. Now let's add that to our already known factor load of, actually that should be a 21, seeing all these minor things as we go, I do apologize. That should be a 2. So 600 kip feet plus the additional 21 kip feet should give us a total of 621 kip feet of, of moment. And just checking, there we go. Now also, since this is part of a design, we don't know what the size of our rebar is yet. So right now we're just going to assume that the effective depth for the entire T-beam is the total depth of 22 inches minus an estimate of 3 inches. Again, total depth of 22 inches minus 3. And again, that 3 inches is assumed to a cover one to cover one and a half inches of cover plus the total, this total stirrup diameter, which we'll assume is a number three, and half the diameter of a rebar. We just don't know it yet because we haven't designed for it. So now we have our assumed or estimated effective depth of 19 inches. So let's design based on that. So now what we also need to determine is our effective width of our flange. And again, B sub B is totally based on code. So let me bring out one, two, three. So B sub E is either the 
it's the least value of the three. So it's either one quarter of the span length, so we have one quarter 15 feet, which is 3.75 feet or 45 inches. The effective width has to be less than the width of the web plus 16 times the thickness of the flange. So the width of the web is 12 inches plus 16 times the thickness of the flange. That gives us to a total of 4 inches, which is the flange, which gives us a total of 76 inches or the center to center spacing of beams. Now in this case, the center to center spacing of our T-beams is 8 feet. And again, as you can see from the math, the smallest or the least value of those is the 45 inches. So that's going to be our effective, our effective width, B sub E. So now moving to our next step, we want to what we're trying to do is determine can all of the compressive strength be handled in the flange? Going back to our diagram. If all of the compressive strength can be handled in the flange, which is essentially the slab, then it's not a T-beam. It's just a regular slab and beam combination, essentially, or what we call a rectangular T-beam. Now, if it does turn out that we need additional strength in the web to handle all of the compressive strength, then it does have the T-beam shape, which essentially looks like this. I can pretty much tell you from this example problem it'll be a rectangular T-I, true T-beam, because then this wouldn't be a very interesting problem. So let's compute how much strength is in the flange and if that's sufficient to carry all of the load. There we go. So if we determine how much strength is in the flange, again, we're assuming bending, so our five factor is 0.9, times our strength, our additional strength reduction factors of 0.85. Strength of the concrete at prime C is 3 KSI. The effective width we just calculated to be 45 inches. The thickness of the flange is 4 inches, or the slab. We're assuming our effective depth is approximately 19 inches, minus H to the F divided by 2. That gives us a total of 7,023 kip inches, or 585 feet. Now, if you go back to where we were just one slide ago, that's not enough. We have a total moment of 621 kip feet. So the flange can't handle the entire load. So because of that, that means we need additional capacity in the web, and therefore it's a true T-beam. So let's determine the amount of steel that we're going to need. Because we recognize that we're going to have to balance that out. So we have the total required steel in the flange to balance out the flange is the 723 divided by the strength reduction factor times the strength of the steel divided by D minus F, H sub F divided by 2. So just in the flange, that means that the steel has to be 7.65 square inches. Well, let's go over that and exactly what does that mean. So we just said, again, let me see if I can erase this little piece here. We just said that the flange has a capacity of 585 kip feet which means that we need to provide, if this is compressive, that means we need to provide as much steel to balance the two out. So looking at our numbers, so the, com the flange can handle 585 kip feet of compression. That means we need to provide 7.65 square inches of steel to balance that out in tension. Because remember, we always assume balanced failures. We want to, and then what we do is we back off the steel just a little bit to make the steel fail first. So again, just as a reminder, 585 kip feet is how much the flange can handle or the slab can handle in compression, which means we need to provide just as much steel to balance that out in tension. So now that we've taken care of the flange, Let's start looking at 
the web, which is actually the beam portion. So let's determine the amount of steel that we're going to need to balance out the web. I'll show you all of that in one step. Now the depth of the web is a little bit different, again, because we're not considering the flange. We've already taken care of that concrete. So when we're looking at the depth of the web, we're looking at this depth here. So it's 22 inches minus the 4 inches of the flange, which gives us an initial starting effective depth of 18 inches. Minus, again, we're, we're always going to assume about 3 inches to, come to account for the cover, a stirrup, and half the diameter of a rebar. So the remaining balance that we have, we started with a total applied moment that was factored of 621. The flange can handle 585 of that. So when you subtract the two, you have the balance, which is about 36 kit feet. Multiply that by 12 inches per foot to turn it into inches. Divided by our 5 factor of 0.9 for bending. The width of the web is still 12 inches. And as we said, our estimated effective depth of the web is 15 inches squared. That gives us a K factor of 0.1778. So let's see what that means for our term rho and how that turns into the amount of steel that we need. Again, this is to balance out the compression in the, in the web with steel in tension. So if you're looking at table A, let's see. Table A8, the closest value to point 0.1778 is approximately 0.1792 for K bar value. And that translates to a row of 0.0031. So now taking that back to our example problem, our point 0.0031 times our B sub W times D sub W, 12 times 15, gives us an area in the web of steel of 0.558 inches squared. So the total area of steel that we need to balance out both the flange and the web is the sum of the two. So this is the area to balance out the compression of the flange. And this is the area to balance out the compression in the web. So our total steel for tension is 8.21 square inches, which I'll tell you honestly, when I first saw that, that's quite a lot of steel. So let's start to look at that. So now we need to select a rebar based on 8.21 square inches of steel. I'm totally giving it away by saying that I selected two rows. Because if you go and look at table A2, 8.21. So I'm starting to look at this table, 8.21. I would either need six number 11s, seven number 10s, nine number 9s, 11 number 8s. You start to get where I'm going. Because if I look at table A3, is it going back? Just as an example, let's start with the first one. I'm just going to circle all of our options. There are not too many. All right, let's look at, take a look at a few of these. Let's first start with six number 11s. If you go to table A3, and I want six number 11s, that means I need a minimum width of 19.5 inches. Going back to our original problem, the width of our web is only 12 inches. Let's try another one. Seven number 10s. Seven number 10s require a width of 20.5 inches. Try one more. Nine number 9s. Nine, number nine is 23 inches. I think you can start to see the pattern where clearly 
one row of rebar just won't work. It will, it, you can't find a combination that will fit. So what I did was I went back and said, okay, well now let me try two rows of rebar. And we first started out with six number 11s. Well, why don't I try making two rows of number 11s? Well, this is not the best sketch by any means. At least it'll give you an idea as to what we're talking about. If we make two rows of three number 11s each, that'll give us six number 11s for a total area of 9.36, which is above the amount required of 8.21. And also, if we go back to table number three, three number 11s requires a minimum width of 11 inches, and we have 12. So that fits within the 12 inch window. But we are changing the location of our effective depth D. So what initially was located at the centroid of one row now moves to the center of that collective six rebar. So it makes our D less. So because of that, I need to go back and make some adjustments to my calculation. So now my D is no longer 22 minus 3. It's probably closer to 22 minus 4 because of that shift. Because now I have to do a full rebar, a full stirrup, plus cover, plus probably about a half inch of spacing in between the two rows. So that gives me now an effective depth of 18 inches, and also an effective depth of just the web, again, being this is just the web, of 18 minus 4, which will bring us back to the centroid of the 6 rebar, and that's 4 inches. So I just have to backtrack a little bit. It doesn't take me too much time. So I redo steps 6 through 8. That means I have a new gross area required of 8.4. If I go back to my previous step, which if I go back to my K, I have to change 15 to 14 inches. So again, just so that you can see, this gets changed to 14 inches squared. Also changed to 14. So that will give me a new area of steel in the web. And then also, I want to change my effective depth here to 18. And that will give me a new area. But when I recalculate that area, it doesn't change all too much. Instead of 8.21, it becomes 8.4. And again, one reason why I didn't mind selecting a significantly, but a larger total area of steel is because I knew I'd probably have to readjust all of that. Again, it doesn't take too long just to make those quick adjustments. And especially if you properly document, whether it's on an exam or on a project, it's very quick to manipulate. So now that we have our total area, again, we checked. We said we're OK, because three number 11s only requires 11 inches of space, and we have 12. Get from table A3. Let's check our actual depth, because now we know what the size of our rebar is. Our actual depth is 22 inches minus the cover of 1.5 inches, minus the stirrup, which we're assuming is 3 inches, or 0.375 inches in diameter, minus a whole diameter of a number 11 rebar, and minus approximately a half inch due to the spacing in between the number 11 on the bottom row and the number 11 on the top row. So we're assuming that centroid is about halfway in between, uh, is about, about, is halfway in between and that distance from the top of the bottom row of the rebar is about a half inch. When we subtract to everything, we get approximately 18.2 inches, which is larger than our initial estimate of 18. So that's good. Let's check the minimum area of steel required. Again, this is just ACI code. The minimum, this is what you get from table A5. So for 60,000 KSI steel and 3,000 KSI 
concrete. Your value is 0 0.0033 as a minimum. So 0 0.0033 times the width of your web, which is 12 inches, times your actual effective depth of 18.2, gives you a total required steel of 0 0.72 inches squared, which is clearly much less than your actual required based on M sub U. And then after that, it's just good to do a check, or not check, to do a sketch. So here, mine isn't a very good sketch, but let's see if we could do a little something here. You would also want to show your stirrup. So that way you know what you're working with. You have your six rebar in two rows of three. And then you would label all of your, your overall heights and depths of the flanges. You don't necessarily have to input, put in your effective depth because that could always be calculated directly. Now that's an example of a T-beam design where it's actually a true T-beam. Now let's try a column design problem. So in this problem, we're asked to design a short, circular, concentric column to carry a factored axial load of 700 kips. You're also asked to design the spiral. Assume that f prime c is 4 ksi and f of y is 60 ksi. And the column is 12 feet long, which again, you'll need just for an additional information, particularly the weight. So let's determine the factored load piece of view. Again, we're given a total piece of view of 600 kips. And again, in this case, we weren't asked to add in the weight of the column, so we can assume that's in that 600 kip estimate. Let's determine their required gross area to transfer that load of 600 kips in compression. We're going to assume that rho is 0 0.03, since we have other, no other given value. Since it's a circular column, that means it's a spiral, and the strength reduction factor is 0.7. Our gross area, again, here's our formula for a spiral. I'm just going through all of the terms. Again, we have our applied load of 600 kips. We have our initial factor of 0.85 times 0 0.70 for a spiral. Again, minus, and just as a reminder what each piece is, this is the stress due to the concrete. This is the stress due to steel. Because again, essentially what you're doing is you're dividing force divided by stress to give you area. So we have for the concrete portion, we have 0.85 times 4 ksi times 1 minus 0 0.03. And that, that tells us how much the concrete is going to transfer. And essentially, if you look at it, if you're looking at this number, 1 minus 0 0.03, essentially 97% of the compressive stress is transferred through the concrete. Again, if you can kind of think of bringing the reinforcement ratio, gives you a sense of how much is being transferred through that medium, whether it's concrete or steel. And the remaining, say 3%, is being transferred through the steel. That gives us a total gross area of 261. Now, since this is a circle, you could just calculate the area, or you can use the table, table A14, let me go back for one second. We said we had a gross area of 261 square inches. So the closest one would be an area of 19 inches. Now I recognize this is really for core calculations, but I'm just using the math more for simplicity. So a 19 inch diameter translate, it translates into 283.5 square inches. So it should be 283.5, so I rounded to 284. So again, what does that mean? Oh, I apologize. I do. I did add the weight of the column now that I know it. So if I add the weight of the column in, it's a dead load, so it's 1.2 times the unit weight of the concrete, which again, I noticed I've made the same mistake. That's a kip per linear foot times the area, again, that's the cross-sectional area, times the length of the column, which is 12 feet. 
I converted 284 square inches into feet squared, and that gave me an additional axial load of 5 kips. And again, that's due to the factored weight of the column. And again, looking, that's, it's very, very minor compared to the total. The total axial load is 600 kips plus an additional 5 kips due to the weight of the column. So that gives me a total of 605 kips. Okay, let me just change. I made some changes as I was working on this, these problems. So that's 605 kips. So if you add the weight of the column to the total load for a piece of you equal to 605 kips and check, check, uh, check step two, the column of 19 inches still works. And again, just looking at the numbers, if you change this very quickly to 605, the area will go up very slightly, but again, you're already choosing a, a larger area of 284. So again, you're still within the range. So again, assuming the eccentricity is small, that means all of the load is passing axially. There is no applied moment due to the load being eccentric. So that means the concrete can handle a total of 557 kips Again, that formula again is 0.85 times phi times 0.85 F prime C, gross area, 1 minus rho. So we plug in our values. The concrete can handle a total of 557. Well, that's not enough. The, the total applied load is 605. So that means that the steel needs to handle the balance. So again, let me correct this. I guess I made some changes as I went to the problem. So 605 minus 557 gives you 148. Actually, no, it doesn't. I do apologize. I just realized that I had made an error. So actually, I changed the problem midway through between 700 to 600. So actually, assuming that we're using an applied load of 600 kips plus 500 kips to the weight of the column, 605 minus 557 gives me a difference of 48 kips, which means that the, the steel needs to handle an additional 48 kips of compressive stress. So what does that mean in terms of area of the steel? So 48 kips divided by 0.85 times 0 0.70 for the spiral times the strength of the steel, which is 60 KSI for yield, that gives us a total required area of 1.34 square inches of steel. Now, if we're looking at table A2, let's try again. Typically, we usually don't go lower like a number 3 and a number 4. You could, but often that's used for the spiral. So I'm going to start with the number 5, and the, lo the most appropriate value is 1.55. And also, you like to look for a minimum number of 5 rebar. And the reason why is 5 will give it more of a circular shape. If you do 4, it tends to have more of a square-like shape. And then 3 and 2 and 1 are just not enough rebar to, to cover the circumference of the circle. So let's try 5 number 5. I'm going to write that down real quick. Try 5 number 5. Again, our gross area is 1.55. I apologize for the moderations as we go. Also, my handwriting isn't the best with this, this pen. There we go. But hopefully, you can make it out as, as bad as it is. Now, what does that mean in terms of does it fit? So again, our overall diameter is 19 inches. But when you subtract out two times the cover plus the stirrup that's in there, plus the spiral, excuse me, that means you're working with essentially a core of 19 minus 3 inches, which is 16 inches. And you can fit 16 number 5s in that space. And we only want to put 5, so that means we're OK. So 5 number 5s. That fits. Now, also, we were asked to design the spirals. 
So first, it's very common for, for this file to be a number three for pretty much all of the applications that we're working with. It's most common. So we'll assume it's a number three. Also, what's the maximum vertical spacing between the ties, the spiral? Actually, again, hold on. Okay, so really that shouldn't say ties. It should say spiral. I apologize. It threw me off for a second there. So we're going to assume since the max that there should be vertically between spirals should be between one and three inches, let's just try two. So that will be our design. And also, there's an additional spiral reinforcement ratio. And this is purely based on code. So for that reason, we'll just calculate it and make sure we meet it. The actual reinforcement ratio for the spiral is four times the area of the spiral divided by the diameter of the core times the vertical spacing in between. So we have four times the area of the spiral. Again, when you have a spiral, I'll do my best to kind of give you a quick drawing here. You can kind of see my spiral here. When you cut across and do a cross-sectional area, you only cut across one full, di full diameter of the spiral. So if it's a number three, that has an area of 0.11 inches squared. So that's where that comes from. Divided by the diameter of the core, which is 19 minus 3 inches, again, for 2 times the cover. And again, we assumed a 2-inch vertical spacing. That gives us an actual reinforcement ratio of 0 0.01375. The minimum required is equal to 0.45 gross area minus core area, sorry, gross area divided by core area, minus 1 divided by strength of concrete, divided by strength of steel. I should say times strength of steel divided by, let's just try that again. 0.45 multiplied by gross area divided by core area minus 1 times concrete strength divided by steel strength. OK, now we've got it. So 0.45 times our gross area of 283.5. And just as a reminder, for a 19-inch diameter, 283.5. For our core area of 16 inches, 16 inches has a core area, or for a 16-inch diameter circle, that's 201.1 minus 1. Concrete strength divided by steel strength, that gives us a value of 0 0.01229. As you can see, the minimum is less than the, what the actual is. And then our values, just as a reminder, what area of the spiral, diameter of core, and center to center spacing are. So again, are we meet that code. And so we're good. Now, my diagram here has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if you really, your diagram should look something more like here's your circle. One, two, three, four, five. Obviously, it's not the most beautiful diagram, but you could understand my sketch. And you would show your two inch spiral, sorry, your number three spiral spaced at two inches. You would show your overall area of 19, and that's your design. So, again, if you have any questions, you know where to find me, and good luck on the finals. Take care.